At the end of your life, what will be your legacy? What will you leave behind for future generations? For the world, join the world messenger, Isabella Lundberg, each week as she brings you a new distinguished guest from the business, sports, or entertainment world to share their success, their struggles, and their lessons. They will share their insights into current hot topics that affect everyone. Isabella facilitates an intimate, vulnerable environment to find the true value of humanity and real leadership. Are you ready for your legacy? The legacy that matters? Hello, hello, my beautiful friends. It's Isabella Lundberg here, the world messenger, and I'm inviting you for another epic episode of Legacy Leader Show. And I have uh, actually, instead of one epic guest, two of them. We guys can handle that? Let's (laughs) see. We're here for a special treat. We are actually going to be talking a power couple and what it takes to work in tandem, specifically when you're building your uh, successful entrepreneurial business. And before we hit the success, we hit all the rocks and ups and downs and turns and detours, you name it. And I'm sure all of you can relate to that. Without further ado, I have here in studio with me, Robert and Kaylee Fukui, uh, that I'm super eager to introduce you to. Welcome, Robert and Kaylee. Well, thanks, Thank Isabella. you, Isabella. It's yeah, an thanks. honor to be here with you. Yeah, thanks for having us. This will be fun. Absolutely. You guys published amazing book called Tandem, which we'll go into it, but you also have a two different focuses outside of that that really led you to that amazing harmony and synchronicity and how also, of course, Tandem came about. So do you mind sharing a little bit of background story and how did you guys get tangled into all of that as a couple in personal life and also professionally? Yeah, that's a big question, big story. (laughs) You know, it's one of those things that just kind of evolves, right? I mean, what we're doing now with helping married entrepreneurs and even working together wasn't on our radar when we're dating or even when we first got married, but really just kind of evolved, right? I think kind of a blending of our two lives. And then it just naturally organically happened because your background is different from mine. Yeah, I'm from a third generation entrepreneur family. And so when I met Robert, he was working for a Fortune 500 company. And we were dating and I said to him one time, I see you having your own business. And he thought I was crazy because I hung out with all these entrepreneurs growing up. So I just thought most people have their own business. Yeah, and I was, you know, not a big risk taker, but in general anyway. And I just kind of followed my dad's advice was, you know, go to school, get a good job. <laughs> I didn't stay out of debt. Well, I didn't stay out of debt. You know, when I got out of college, I had quite a bit of debt. But uh, did get a you know what finished my degree in business and marketing and then got a, a nice job with Coca Cola, um, and then I was in the pharmaceutical industry for the most of my career, and you know just really had a nice life, really a great career, um, successful in that, won a bunch of awards and you know all the benefits that come with in the corporate environment. So definitely having a business you know sound like a lot of risk right? Because you're not guaranteed a paycheck. <laughs> so, yes. And so, um, but, you know, as you got into my 40s, you start to think about what's the next phase of life. And then I started exploring having a business and started doing just some marketing consulting on the side and really enjoyed that and enjoyed what it brought to small family business and private business. Because that's who were, I was, I didn't want to, I didn't really want to deal with corporate environment. I was kind of tired of that. I really had a heart for small family business. And I guess because marrying Kaylee and her family business that she was working uh, working with and her dad and all that, just had a heart for that. Um, and then when you see the positive outcomes from you know the advice and the tips that you're and the plans you're putting together for them, it just seemed like it meant so much more mm-hmm. to them as the owner and the direct impact that I saw on, on the business and the owner and their family and then even the employees as well different from being in a fortune 500 company right and so that's kind of what started that journey to do what we did now because we believe that small business is the excuse me the bread and butter of our community and um we need them and there's so many of them are struggling these days and sometimes it's a small little tweaks they need to do to be successful how many times have we gone to a restaurant that's closed that didn't make it or our favorite product or service that we loved and it's gone Mm. 
such a powerful story and journey. And I love one word that you guys used here. I mean, I love everything you said, but specifically you said things happen organically and then how, uh, how you pivoted. And obviously when we look at right now, what's going on with Fortune 500, I'm sure you are, Robert, specifically very, very happy that you're not part of it. And Kaylee, I'm sure you're just like, oh my God, I'm so glad we have uh, our own world going on because it is very volatile and it's not what we used to remember and know for and things that we're seeing that are quite a bit unprecedented on the larger scale. Mm -hmm. But zooming in, you're also doing something unbelievable with your company. You're powering up and you're helping small businesses in very specific assessment. I'm curious because I'm a long, lifelong learner and I always wanted to look at how do we can do things better. So do you mind a little bit giving us insight on that before we jump onto Kaylee and her interesting thing she is doing? Yeah, you know, about four years ago, you know, after consulting for a little bit for us on the side, and then after doing it full time, um, you know, six years ago, started noticing this tension with business owners between, you know, building this business, but then also having a life at home, you know, whether they're single or married, the business really overtook their personal life. And it definitely their personal life and their marriage, if they're married, definitely suffered because they're going so all in on the business. And mm. I was like, you know, that's not good. And I started falling into that same trap too when I was building a consulting business, when I was working on the side from the full-time job with, in the corporate, you know, working till 2 a.m. And I thought, well, that's just how it is. You know, I've heard this. You just got to grind it out. You got to sacrifice your personal life. And then I just called a timeout because I was so tired by Friday and Saturday because I was working till 2 a.m. You know, you have a full-time job during the day and then work the consulting at night that I was just exhausted and I wasn't present for Kaylee. You know, I was there physically, but I wasn't present mentally, emotionally. And so she was very gracious about it because she knew this was just a period, this, a transition. But at the same time, I was thinking, well, where, where do we get this that we have to sacrifice everything to have success professionally? I go, there's no rule. I, you know, I, I had a business degree. There's nothing in the textbooks about that. You know, so I decided like, look, let's just do this differently. You know, there's the adage, work smarter, not harder, yes. but we tend to work harder, not smarter. <laughs> mm. And so I said, okay, let's do this differently. Let's at least set the goal of get to bed by 11 o'clock. If I establish that goal, then I said, okay, how do I do that? How do I still grow the business and get to bed earlier? And so a lot of it was just, you'd realize that there's a lot of busy work that you're doing. It doesn't have to be done, at least in the moment that maybe put those things off or some things you just don't do at all. And then focus, what are the things that are really going to grow the business and focus your time on that and let the other stuff go by the wayside, right? And then, so yeah, I, I was able to get by, bed by 11, um, big difference, right? And then I made sure I carried that on even when I went full time. But then I also noticed with our clients, they're facing the same issue. And yeah. so I said, look, we can do this. You can do this better. You just have to be very intentional about it. But we bought in as business owners, just bought into this, you know, quote unquote fact that you have to sacrifice everything for the sake of the business. And I said, no, we're problem solvers as business owners, as entrepreneurs, we're problem solvers. So we got a problem. Let's solve it. <laughs> I love the attitude and I love the approach. And for everybody watching and listening again, no matter where you are, at, uh, either as an entrepreneur or still working for Fortune 500 companies and desiring to have something going on in your own personal life or build something separate from, from that identity, it's a huge, huge lesson. And then honestly, we come from very workaholic culture where it was the badge of honor to say, I put in today 18 hours as like, really? Uh, and where is your health and everything? else so i'm so glad that you recognize what's wrong and flip that around and find some amazing solutions for that on the other hand kaylee <laughs> did something really exciting uh what did you recognize obviously being brought in and raised then entrepreneurial mindset and spirit and household uh what what really came to light for you you know, there was a lot of wonderful experiences i grew up in having a family business some of the challenges, though, was um, the business became the mistress. My dad worked six days a week. He wasn't home a lot. To this day, I don't know if he made it to my high school graduation. So it was really challenging because when you're a child, you just want your dad to be home to play with you, to go to your games, your baseball games, softball. And so that was really hard. And 
we've also seen too with our clients, if the husband is the primary owner, that the wives get lost in all of it. They lose their identity because it's things become compartmentalized. So he's working, she's home with the kids, doing her own thing. And we're trying to get, or we are with the couples to come together because we have differences. And it's a opposed to seeing them as a sandpaper. Oh my gosh, you drive me crazy when you do this. Bring them together because we're so much stronger when we're living out of each other's giftings. And mm-hmm. we usually marry someone that's opposite than us. And even though the wife might not be a part of the business, there's other aspects that you can bring her in to help you with. Maybe she's good at HR. She's good at discerning, reading people. You know, it could be a lot of different things. Maybe she's great at administration. And just the sounding board and just good counsel in general. You know, even, mm-hmm. you know, we work together, but there's some some of our clients, you know, the wife is is not you know, part of the business. I mean, either they have their own career or their stay-at-home mom, but they can still lend some insight that's different because, you know, we, we all have blind spots. Yeah. And then who else can see your blind spot better than your spouse? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so, yeah. and so you got to listen to it, but also that sometimes it becomes conflict mm-hmm. because it sounds like when your spouse is giving input, the, the owner is thinking, oh, you don't get it, or you're just trying, you don't want me to succeed, or, or, you know, there's all kinds of issues around that, because your spouse is offering a little different a perspective, but it's yeah. probably a correct perspective, because it's something you can't see, because it's your blind spot. I love that you actually mentioned that, because that's one of the main reasons why a lot of people are single, or on dysfunctional relationship, or divorce, because they were not able to really find that level of vulnerability, find a level also honesty and intimacy where the bad and worse and ugly can be shared as well. Not only celebrated all those great successes, right? When it's upper swing, as they say, it's always a lot of friends there or our family members to cheer on. But when tough times come in, when you really have to be resourceful and come up with very uh, strong decisions, that's where really that tandem comes in play. Would you say that? Definitely. Yeah. You know, learning to be able to listen to the tough um, honesty sometimes from your spouse. And so that's why, like, even for me, you know, I always, you know, I think, you know, once you learn when I didn't listen to Kaylee's feeling about something and I did my own thing anyway, and it cost us a lot of money, (laughs) you know, you do that a couple of times, you're like, you know, maybe I should listen to her more. So now instead of reacting, you know, because I get defensive or whatever, because she's saying something counter to what I'm thinking, I just, I might say even, oh, I don't think that's right, but I'll still continue to think about it even a week or a month later, right? Annie? Yeah, he'll <laughs> come back like a month later and I'll say like, you know, I was thinking about da 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 and I think that's a good idea. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Because I've totally forgot about it because he didn't like the idea. So I just went on to the, the next thing and he's like no I've been thinking about it. I'm like for that long and he's like yeah, yeah. <laughs> it takes time to process sometimes you know <laughs> yes and and that's a beautiful thing too to recognize that sometimes we're we process things differently we show up differently with our love affection but also show up with our concerns and it's very important to understand that no matter what that other person is still having not only your best interest right but the overall family best interest and best interest for your relationship and when that is not out of of spoken in a way in the right light can create a lot of conflicts but speaking of that what happened during the covid that prompts you and springboards you not only to write a book obviously but to publish the book and then also help others that are dealing with similar issues right now yeah, it started actually probably 2021, right, was when we started to think about it. You know, we've had a number of people ask us, you know, when are you going to write a book? And I just thought that was way too much work. <laughs> it was like, that sounds like a lot of work. Uh, but then we, you know, as we we're doing what we we're doing and, you know, getting results with our clients and just seeing that, you know, one of the things, even when we started helping married entrepreneurs probably four years ago, really started focusing on this area, you know, I did say to Kaylee, I was like, we're, we got to figure out how to scale this thing. And it wasn't from a business perspective, like to make more money. It was really about how to get this message out 
because no one's really addressing this head on. And so, and I was looking on online on Google, even on books on Amazon, there's really nothing that really focuses, really hits both sides head on, business and marriage, and how to do it well together, both sides. So the book was felt like it was one way we could at least get the message out and scale the message. Sure. Um, and so that's why we decided to do it. And that's why I also decided to hire a ghostwriter because we knew, I knew, because the writing was going to fall on me and it wasn't going to get done if I had to do all the writing. <laughs> so we, we hired some help. Mm. And right now, when you see the vision of that coming to fruition and it's tangible and it's right there next to you uh, with the title, with the cover and with final product, how it, how it makes you feel? Oh my gosh, we're so excited. It's like our our baby <laughs> because, you know, it's a process writing a book. It's not something you can just do, at least for not us overnight. And there were so many decisions and choices. And so it feels good to know that we have our voice out there and we're helping other married entrepreneurs. Yeah, couples. it, did, it take, did take almost nine months yeah. to birth this thing. So, so it's about right. It's like a baby. But uh, yeah, just excited. It was really cool when we first got the book. In fact, you know, we were on a six week book tour promoting the book and we, we left before the book even got published. Um, it was kind of halfway through the trip. So we actually didn't see the book even when it got launched until we got to Houston with one of our friends in a mastermind group and he threw us a book party and all that. And then we finally got to see, hold the book in our hand. Yeah. We walked in the door and he had it sitting on a little table. I'm like, Oh my gosh, our book. Yeah. Time. Um, and it was, it. it was cool because of, I think what we're doing, be able to get the message out. I thought I felt, it felt like this is a quick, easy way to get the information, the principles, experiences and all that in the hands of somebody and it didn't have to rely everything on us um, mm -hmm. because we know we can't help everybody anyway so this is one way we could do it and it felt just like a, a, a quick easy tangible thing that could help people help couples that's amazing and for everybody watching and listening the name of the book obviously is the cult tandem but do you mind sharing what did you address in the book specifically um so that others can really see tremendous benefit because either you're single and you're dating or definitely getting married or married uh and having your own business and trying to navigate that with everything else i mean i'm sure everybody can truly benefit so can you give us some highlights so that people can really go and check it out? <laughs> well, even if you're not married, you can still use it because relationships, right? Resolving mm -hmm. conflict. We have to do that in the day-to-day, -day, whether you're married or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the overall theme is greater work-life balance. And so, yeah, regardless if you're single or married, <laughs> we need it. And in fact, singles are probably worse offenders because because you're single, you don't have someone else to take <laughs> care of, right? Or to be responsible with. You can just grind it out in your business. Work even more hours. Yeah, yes. work even more hours. And then your personal life, your personal health takes a toll. And it's cool when you're younger because you can take deal with that. But as you get older, it takes a toll and mm -hmm. it starts to come out, you know, both emotionally, mentally, and physically. So work-life balance is the theme. And then as Kate was sharing, you know, we deal with relationships, communication, and conflict resolution, which is also a transferable skill into your business because relationships, communication, conflict resolution is essential in your business. <laughs> and then on, on, the, on the business part of the book, it's how do you work smarter, not harder? How do you grow and scale without working yourself nutty? And so we we address three primarily pillars, which is time, money, and performance. So how do you maximize your time? How do you put your time into best use? Not putting more time in, but put be most productive with the time you do put into a business. And on the money side, how do you maximize that margin? Not about getting more sales and doing more volume, but how do you get more profit margin? Part of it is by maximizing your time, be more productive. The other part is maybe adjusting your price so you can get the best profit margin. And then performance is how do you measure all those, everything that you do in the business from marketing to operations and all that. And how do you measure those, those create metrics? So you can measure the performance and then look to see how you can improve the metrics. Because when you improve the metrics, it's not about putting more time in. It's just improving the outcomes and based on what you're doing, right? Both money and time. And so all that is you put all that together is then is it's about how do you do work and life better? Hmm. 
that is so powerful. I'm so glad that you addressed such a important topic and you're spot on it is relevant to all of us but interestingly we're seeing a lot of shift right we're seeing exodus of talent we're seeing of trends that were never vocalized to this extent from quiet quitting to quiet firing to quiet hiring and shifts even changes uh uh in small to all the way to obviously um mega large enterprises and anything in between and um how do we position to be more successful, right? Increases mm -hmm. chances of outcomes that you're mentioning in an ultimately our performance. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. So, so with this in mind, obviously you, you're tackling this as a couple, but you also bring in great perspective because a lot of times people don't see that, you know, even again, as a single person or married or anything in between, what we really forget about it is um, how it affects other people, right, around us and specifically the ones that we spend the most time with. So from that perspective, do you mind sharing how did you bridge the gap between now being a couple and husband and wife, actually, for that matter, and now also being a partners in crime in the business. And, and, and that how did you arrive where you are at today? So like, how do you manage working together and just doing life together? Yes, because <laughs> it's, it's a truly fine art. And a lot of people, no matter how great or aware they are, cannot achieve that. So and I'm sure that many have a deep desire to make that happen. So please give us some advice. Well, I think sometimes it can be challenging. We just got back from vacation and I had to be very intentional about electronics, not turning on my electronics, not talking about work. Because once I get talking about work, it's like that switch gets flicked and then I can't get out of work mode. And I'm like, I don't want to spend my whole vacation. I want to enjoy my husband. I don't want to be talking about work. I could be at home talking about work. So I had to be very intentional about not going to that place. Yeah. So boundaries is basically what she's mm -hmm. talking about is having those boundaries between work and home. Because when you're, especially when you're working together, it's easy for work to be the conversation piece for everything. Right. You go to dinner, <laughs> right. you know, you're talking about work still. And so that's one piece is having, having those boundaries. But being able to work together both in and out also just requires, as Kaylee was sharing earlier, about really appreciating each other's gifts, each other's strengths, and using your differences to complement each other, not make it not conflict with each other. You know, when we're when you're dating, your differences are cute and it's endearing. It's like, oh, it's great. And then for some reason, once you say I do, those differences become very irritating. Yeah, you're irritating me. <laughs> and, so, and so nothing's changed, right? The first, we haven't changed as people. We just, I think our attitude and perspective has changed. Um, and so really taking a step back and appreciating each other's differences. And how do you work with each other's differences, right? Both at home and at work, you know, those differences are great because where I'm good at, she's maybe weak, but where she's good at, I'm weak. Right. And we can complement each other and learn how to. And in a lot of times, you know, especially when you're working together, you know, the business owner thinks they know it all. And then because it's a spouse you're talking to, they treat the, you treat the spouse a little differently than you would an employee, mm -hmm. basically not as professional. <laughs> and, you know, an employee, you're hiring them for specific tasks. So hopefully you're giving them empowerment to do these things. But for some reason, when your spouse, you tend to micromanage a little bit more than you normally would even with an employee. Mm. So really allowing them to just flourish and what they're good at, right? And so, and one of the mistakes we see a lot of husband and wife teams do is you got the business owner and then you got a spouse that's going to come in and help, but they put their spouse money in position just to fill a position, to fill an empty spot because it's cheaper <laughs> to hire your spouse than to hire people on the market. And you put your spouse in a position that not, they're not gifted at. And then what happens is they're not happy. Obviously, they're not going to be good at that job because it's not part of their gift and skill mix. So which means they're probably not good at it, which means they'll probably be making some mistakes. Then the business owner gets upset. It's really bad for the relationship. It's bad for the business. But then you got to look at what's the best use of their gifts, skills, and talents. And then find that position that really, then when they're in that position, they thrive. Just like any other position for any employee, you want to put them in some a position 
in which to thrive because it's part of their gift mix. Yeah, we're speaking from personal experience here. <laughs> yeah, I put her in charge of QuickBooks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then I would just put it off. And then he would say, honey, have you done it? No. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to do it. And then I would do it. And he would be like, you didn't do it right. And then I'm like, you're criticizing me. <laughs> Stop telling me what to do. And then it just turned into a big mess. <laughs> yeah. And I'm the numbers guy. And I put her in charge of QuickBooks. And, and she's also not, Canadian. and she also like doesn't like the computer too much either. And so all, all around, it was not a wise move, but it's because I didn't want to do it. It filled up a spot. <laughs> It filled my need, but it wasn't a best use of her time and talent. Such a great story and great example, because we see the same same thing similarly also in working environment, right? Mm -hmm. When when you have, a, as you said, employee where you feel like, oh, because we now have a gap, maybe we can dump this additional thing for them to do. And in reality, if we don't explain or if we don't train or get them up to speed to knowledge, but also not really playing on their strengths. Uh, so you guys obviously master that through trial and error and playing onto each other's strengths and outsourcing what you don't want to do or don't have a time to do. And as a result, things are much more, not only harmonious, but I'm assuming very much so more successful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. <laughs> and a lot more productive. <laughs> yeah. And we're happier. Yeah. And we're all happier. <laughs> So guys, for everybody watching and listening, all those hardworking entrepreneurs that are being seduced, including myself, the longer hours we put, more we're in the front of the computer, the more dedicated we are, uh, it's going to play out and pay out later on, just keep persevering. It's uh, not the wise advice to do, because if we're not measuring, if we're not adjusting, mm -hmm. knowing what we're doing, right, it's, we can spend rest of our lives trying to hit that mark, the growth, the money, whatever it might be, ultimately to why we're doing something in the first place and yet not achieve it. Yeah, because there's definitely not a direct correlation between the amount mm -hmm. of time you put into business and success, right? Exactly. It's about, you want to look at the time you put in, what kind of output or investment you can create. It's just like investing, right? If you, all you do is put all your money into a savings account, it's just money in, and then money in and doesn't grow. Well, you never look <laughs> at it either, right? Right. But if you put money into something that appreciates an, an interest, then you can create greater outcomes with the money that you put in. So just like with your time, is what can create the better, best outcome and productivity with the time you put in, not just put time, more time in, because then it's just time and time, <laughs> you know, right? So you want to put, you want to have your time be able to appreciate and value and not just putting more time. So that way you'll have greater output with the amount of time you put in. Mm. And for someone who has been so always fascinated around the performance and how sometimes certain people, no matter with the same training or same attitude and aptitude, will have a different outcomes, which we did not again at that time look at their skill set level and strengths, right? But then even if you match that, it's like why still some people perform in a different level than the others? Why someone go a mile longer or faster or further or quicker uh, to accomplish certain things? And it's always been so fascinating because we wish to measure as 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 I'm sure you can relate to you, Robert. If you have a wrong KPIs and a wrong ROIs, you're not going to never really know what to tweak and what to change. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Those metrics are, they're boring, they're tedious. Stuff they're, people don't want to look at. They're necessary. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the biggest, like we had a, last year we had helped turn around a, a company that was, you know, losing million, you know, seven figures a year. And their, their thought process was get more sales. Mm -hmm. Right. And I'm like, no. <laughs> because you're already, you're already busy enough. I go, we just need to improve on these different metrics. And it was improving, like say just for sales, for example, they're, you know, <laughs> part of their business was e-commerce. Well, what if we, on your website, instead of just the average of one unit per transaction, what if we got it to 1.2? Mm. That's a 20% increase in sales. And also it doesn't, you're not putting in more, pay-per-click money into it too. You're just improving the outcome. Whatever the budget you're already putting in for marketing, now we're just improving the outcome without putting in more time or money. 
and it's right. not increasing the labor either. Yeah, and increase and it's it increases a little bit, not but not incrementally. So really, you're increasing your profit margins because your 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 sales per transaction has gone up with the same amount of effort and money putting in. And you're also reading the market correctly. So you know, do you have a room and you know, let's just drive. And a lot of times we're not willing to try it, right? And we will never know because we're automated with mindset that will may not work or it's too expensive or whatever might be the attitude. I mm-hmm. love that example because right now we're dealing with a lot of things unless we give a shot and give a try and 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 have some additional data to support one way or the other, we will never know. Yeah, yeah, you got to keep track. <laughs> Definitely, because sometimes people, their money maker is not what they think it is. A lot of times, and they're not doing anything with that product or service because they're attached to something else over here. And then when we go in and look at the numbers. We're like, oh my gosh, you need to be spending your time over here on the one that, you know, the yeah, step- margins. Yeah, sometimes they're they're totally not paying attention to the product or service that has the highest margin. Mm-hmm. And it's it's already generating some good income just organically. Mm-hmm. But then they're spending all this money on another product or service that has very low margins. And I'm like, what if we shifted our efforts over here? <laughs> right? I mean, just, and it's, you're not changing like advertising dollars or the way you market. It's maybe just what you're marketing. And it's all about, it's just a little repositioning. And without, putting in more time or effort or money into it, all of a sudden you get this greater outcomes and more money without without putting any more time or, or money into it. And that's a beautiful point when we have that strategic uh, lens and also wisdom and support for someone to really can look at from outside in. Um, it's such an easier way to pick that. But when you're so entrenched, emotionally attached and believe that's only one way or it has to be done in a certain way, then we see a lot of these issues that we were mentioning earlier that, that your book is solving and your services, which is truly helping people to see things from different perspective and not being stuck and continue to grow and learn and adjust. But with that in mind, I'm curious now, as you guys established all of this and helping entrepreneurs to move the needle in the right direction. What's next? What's next in the bucket list for Fukui uh, family, for Fukui tandem? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, r- right now we're just kind of focusing on this. The, this will be the first year that the book has been available and just really focus on just getting the word off, you know, being on podcasts and shows like yours and different speaking engagements and getting into different, you know, business organizations and all that, just so we can help as many more, as much people as possible. And it's really putting the hands, uh, putting the book into the hands of people and organizations get to, that can turn around and help others, right? We're looking about how to scale the message and the principles. And it's not just by us alone. Mm-hmm. We're just trying to figure out how do we get, how do we empower other people and organizations, to do it. And so that's what our focus is this year. Um, and then who knows what a second book might look like. It's, people, it's kind of weird. We just launched a book and people are already asking about the second book. And I'm like, look, we just, <laughs> we're retired. <laughs> so you obviously don't know anything about publishing the book and how much it costs and what efforts. And yeah. 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 We, yeah, we got, we got some, some See, things. She knows she's an expert. Yeah. We got some things to do with this book. You know, we haven't even scratched the surface, I think with this one. So we want to put our best foot forward with this. And then, you know, I, I think organically uh, that work he's coming up, the next book will come out. Um, and so, yeah. We're just we're, enjoying this one at the moment though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, it's like the same thing with Kacha. Like you just give a birth to one child and they're already thinking, where's it going to come second? Exactly. So it's the human nature because we always feel like, oh, so that's, that's something else is coming. Yeah. And and you spot on, we have to slow down and fully be grateful for what we have. And also be able to enjoy, as you mentioned, fully because uh, it's such a great experience, specifically with the first one. So I really, really want to just emphasize with everybody watching and listening to check your book, to check your websites, to connect with you. And speaking of that, where they can find you, I obviously find you on LinkedIn and you guys have amazing bios and also opportunity to um share some of the links of your companies, but where would you like audience eager to learn more from your book to go? Yeah, you can go to marriedentrepreneur.co and then you can see all our stuff, our coaching courses, whatever, podcasts. And then 
Also, there's a link to the book, but the book also has its own website, thetandembook.com. And then, of course, on Instagram and Facebook, you can find us at Power Couples by Design. And mm. so that's one where, another variety of areas that you can find us. Fantastic. And one thing I want to ask in closing for that Power Couple by Design if you could give advice to anyone watching and listening, how to be that power couple, not because we're seeing all these trends to flash all the money and expensive cars and vacations, look at us, but really what that means and how to reach that. Because trust me, so many people want to be in power couple relationship or have that experience, but yet they don't know where to start and how to make that happen. I think it's, basically, you know, have a fulfilled life together, mm -hmm. you know, when in, when in all areas and <laughs> don't accept the status quo that how your life is now is the way it's supposed to be, you know, grinding out in business and not having a life or whatever, just Katie's always been good about, especially relationally, not accepting the status quo that you can always do better, both in business and in marriage. And it's, it's a journey. You're never going to fully reach the pinnacle of success in in both business and marriage so don't think like you've ever had it you've, you've reached it and so just don't accept the status quo and just keep improving for each other and you got each other to help push you along right. right and i think it looks different for every couple it's not one size fits all it's sitting down and dreaming and doing a vision what is this going to look like for us as a couple for our business for personal and then you support each other and I know with us, sometimes I'll have an idea, Robert will have a completely different idea, but when we bring it together, it's even better than it was, you know, on our own. And so, um, and just being fulfilled. I mean, we believe you can have your family and also have a successful business together. Yeah, just make sure you enjoy the journey, mm -hmm. right? As you're succeeding in business, as you're building the business, growing the business, enjoy the journey. You got to take that time every day, week, month, to just have some gratitude about the journey you're on. Even if the business isn't doing well right now, there's always something to be grateful for. And you really got to recognize that, you know, we're such achievers that we don't achieve the, we don't recognize and, and appreciate even the small things. And I think that's what you got to be doing to stop and smell the roses, as they say, and really just enjoy the journey because sometimes we get this vision and goal of what we mm -hmm. want to achieve. And then we get there and we don't even like it. And so, and so, that's why it's so important to enjoy the journey and because, be intentional yeah because and you never know what the future holds because sometimes people wait for retirement to enjoy life and then they get there and their health goes mm -hmm. and leave us positive review whenever you are listening on whatever platform there might be make sure your friends and family also know about the benefit and value that we provide and what we have to offer cheers